Greetings, welcome to Unit 2 Chemistry Note Video Number 2. So if you're looking for Note Video Number 2, you are in the right place. Alright, so in the last Note Video we talked about temperature and the different temperature scales and who came up with them and the temperatures that you need to know. Well, there's a couple other aspects of thermal energy and heat um, that you need to be able to discern between. So temperature, remember, is the average speed at which, it's represented anyway, by the average speed of all the particles in the material. So if it's the air, it's the average speed of all of the particles in the air. If it's the table, it's the average speed of vibration of all of the molecules that are making up that table. So how is that different from thermal energy? Thermal energy is the total energy of all the particles in an object. Now, if you think about this mathematically, well, how do you calculate average? Well, when you calculate average, you add up all of the values and then divide by the number of values that you have. That is temperature. Thermal energy is the total. So it's what you get when you add up all of the values. So you would actually have thermal energy first if you were trying to calculate temperature like specifically atom by atom and molecule by molecule. So when you add up all of the available energy in all of the particles in, in the substance, that is your thermal energy. When you would then divide that thermal energy by how many particles you have, that would be your temperature. So if we look at a couple of examples, a liter of water has a certain amount of molecules in it. And let's say that liter of water is sitting at 40 degrees Celsius, which let's think about it, how hot is 40 degrees Celsius? Well, if 37 is body temperature, then that means this is going to be roughly about 105 degrees-ish, give or take. So would a liter of water at 40 degrees Celsius have more or less thermal energy than a liter of water at 70 degrees Celsius? Well, we have the same volume, so we have the same number of molecules. In this volume, though, they're going at a slower speed. In this volume, the average is going at a much faster speed. So that means the liter of water at 40 degrees Celsius would have less thermal energy than the liter of water at 70 degrees Celsius. Well, what if we have the same temperature but change the volume? So if we had a liter of water at 20 degrees Celsius, which is room temperature, so that's about 70 degrees Fahrenheit, and we have half a liter of water at the same temperature, which one has more thermal energy? Well, in this case, it would be the one with the larger volume. Because the particles are moving the same speed, but in the one with the larger volume, you have more particles. So when you add them all together, you're going to end up with a greater thermal energy. Um, for the most part, this is how I will phrase the questions on these. I can't think of an example right now, but you never know when one might come up, where I will actually give you a different volume and a different temperature. If I did do that, though, it would probably be pretty extreme, so um, you would be able to figure it out. Now, how is that related to heat? All right, so if temperature is the average particle speed, and the thermal energy is the total particle speed, heat is actually defined as what occurs when thermal energy is transferred from one material to another. Now heat always flows in the same direction. If you think about seventh grade where we talked about osmosis and diffusion, in osmosis and diffusion it always flows from where there's more of something to where there's less. Salt will always diffuse across a membrane from, a, from an area with more concentration to an area with less concentration. Heat flows the same kind of direction. Heat will always flow from a place with a higher temperature or a higher thermal energy, I suppose, to one with a lower thermal energy. Let's think about that. Um, that's probably just temperature. So heat will transfer from a place with a higher temperature to a place with a lower temperature. So if you grab something and it feels cold, there's actually no such thing as coldness. What's happening is that your body has a higher temperature than the object that you're grabbing. So it's going to pull some of that temperature out of your skin. It's going to pull that thermal energy out of your body and make it go into the object. And your nerves in your brain translate that into being colder. So 
the loss of thermal energy, your nervous system picks up on that as a feeling of coldness. If your body is picking up thermal energy from something else, then your body interprets that as warmness. That's how your brain sends those signals to your, to your, uh, your conscious. So temperature, just to wrap everything up, temperature is the average speed, thermal energy is the total speed, and heat is the transfer of that energy. So that, that means that heat doesn't actually exist until that energy gets moved from one substance to another. So when we do calculate heat and we measure it, we measure it in a unit called joules. Joules are named after a guy by the name of James Prescott Joule. And he was kind of a lab partner. He worked pretty close with Lord Kelvin, as we learned about before. Um, he created the, the, the first law of thermodynamics, and he helped a lot with the law of conservation of energy. So he was a pretty important scientist back in the day. This is a concept that requires some math to understand. Um, sometimes it throws some kids off, so let's talk about it. It's called specific heat. And specific heat is one of the identifying characters of matter. So if you know the specific heat of an unknown, subs of an unknown substance, you can use that to help you identify what the substance is. Because all materials have their own like specific heat value. And what specific heat is, the definition is, if I say it in a nice dry voice, it is the amount of energy needed to raise one kilogram of material one degree Kelvin. So to translate that into eighth grade speak, um, every material has to absorb a different amount of thermal energy in order to speed up the molecules because temperature is a measurement of how fast the molecules are going. And molecules are different sizes because they're made of different atoms, so they have different amounts of mass. So sometimes they need more energy to get them up to speed. Also, depending on what the, what the structure is, if it's a solid, sometimes those molecules are kind of locked in place because of the nature of it being a solid. And that requires then more energy to get them to vibrate because they're, they're locked in position. So different materials have different specific heats. And we can reference a chart to figure out what these are. So just for example, down here, um, we have gold, iron, glass, and wood. So here's a list of some substances and the specific heats that go along with them. So if we look at the lowest one, gold, that means that it would take 129 joules of energy to raise one kilogram of gold, so roughly 2.2 pounds of gold, one degree Kelvin. Remember, one degree Kelvin is also the same size as one degree Celsius. So if we had gold, like a bar of gold, that was 2.2 pounds, so we had one, a one kilogram bar of gold sitting on the table, and we measured the temperature of it, and it was 90 degrees. It would feel nice and warm. We wanted to raise that gold to 91 degrees, we would have to add to that bar of gold exactly 129 joules of energy. And then if we measured the bar of gold again, it would be 91 degrees. So that's what specific heat means. So let's say we had a bar of iron, the exact same mass, sitting next to it. And we added 129 joules of energy to the iron. Would the iron go up 1 degree Celsius? No. Iron is a different substance. In order to raise a, a block of iron one degree Celsius or one degree Kelvin, we would have to add 448 joules of energy. So you'd have to add almost four times the amount of energy to raise the temperature of iron as you would need to raise the temperature of gold. And then the chart here kind of goes up and up and up. Glass takes about twice as much energy to raise it, the temperature than iron does. Wood takes a lot of energy to raise it. So let's see what some of these other blank ones are here. What has roughly twice the specific heat of iron? That's this one with 900. That is aluminum. And it's one of the reasons that we use aluminum a lot when we're like, like aluminum foil. You can put it in the oven, and when you pull it back out, uh, it changes its temperature pretty, uh, like it, it, you, can, you can touch it um, fairly quickly after it gets out, where iron you can't do it so much. It retains its heat a lot more. 
So aluminum would require 900 joules of energy to, to heat up. Um, the highest one on here, though, is water. And water is the gold standard for specific heat. Water is, has the highest specific heat of any naturally occurring substance that I know of. So it takes a lot of energy to heat up water. It's one of the reasons why it takes so long to boil water on your stove, because you have to add a lot of energy into that pot of water in order to actually speed those molecules up. It's, it has to do with the nature of how the molecules are kind of linking together. Um, but water has a really, really, really high specific heat, which is also why when you do get water boiling, there is a tremendous amount of thermal energy in there and you never want to put your hand in boiling water. I would rather grab a piece of metal that was at the temperature of boiling water than I would put my hand in boiling water because of the amount of heat that's in there. So in other words, um, when you put your hand in the boiling water, for example, which has a specific heat of the 4,000, and you would grab a piece of iron that might be the same temperature, you're exposing yourself to like 10 times the amount of thermal energy, 10 times the amount of heat um, than, than with the iron. So that's why boiling water causes really bad burns. All right, let's put these to some uh, questions here. The answers are not going to come up on the PowerPoint because I want you to think about them and then we'll talk about them in class before the booby trap. It's kind of thing that the computer will call on maybe a random group to see if they have the right answer. So what would make the best combination for a cooking pot? So you're cooking something on the stove. You want the metal of the pot to heat up quickly so you don't have to wait for it, but yet you want the handle of the pot to not heat up so you could grab it and move it around. So which materials listed would you want to make that material out of? Why do we pump water through a car's radiator? Well, in case you don't know how a car works, a car burns gasoline inside the engine. Um, that creates a lot of heat. That's why it's called an internal combustion engine. And not only that, you get lots of moving parts. And when you have all these parts spinning and moving and rubbing against each other, you create lots of friction, which is also lots of heat. So we need to get that, that heat out of the engine or else it'll actually heat up so much that it'll melt the metal and the engine, instead of it becoming a bunch of loose moving parts, will become one solid block of metal. And that's bad. You don't want to let that happen to your motor. There's no coming back from that. So some things that we do to prevent this buildup of heat, one, we put oil in it to make it so that the pieces move around easier, and that helps prevent heat from building up in the first place. But we need to get that heat out of the motor. So we put water through the motor. So there's pathways through the motor that we run water through the radiator. Why is it that we use water to do this instead of some other liquid, say, like alcohol. And the last question, which is actually what your gizmo is about, if you started working on that, why does the wind blow in from the sea on a hot day? So since we're talking about specific heat here, you should think about this in terms of specific heat. So we have water out here, we have land in here, they're going to have different specific heats. And as we can see from the chart, the specific heat of water is like the highest. So it's going to have a higher specific heat than the land. So try to come up with a reason why you get a sea breeze on a hot day. And a sea breeze is the one where the wind blows across the water and up to the land. I thought I had a picture in this note video. I think it came out because the explanation wasn't there for why wood has such a high specific heat. Um, you learned about this last year. I'll just explain it since the picture's not coming up. You learned about this last year when you learned about cells. Plant cells are surrounded by a cell wall. Pull up here a little. Let me uh, 
Ooh, we can use graph paper. Nice, we can make graph paper be wood. So, plant cells are surrounded by cell walls, which are made of cellulose. And after the plant dies, or after those cells die, you are still left with the cell walls. So we can pretend that these gray lines of the graph paper are cell walls, empty cells. This is what we call wood. Wood is nothing more than a whole bunch of empty plant cells left over after the plant has died. The cellulose is still there. The cell wall is still there. So inside those cell walls are air. In other words, when thermal energy tries to get through the wood, it has to pass through a bunch of pockets of air. And air is actually a really good insulator. It takes a long time for, for thermal energy to travel through air because air has these particles that are spread out from each other. So to get them to run into each other and transfer that energy along is a lot more difficult. It happens much slower than if you were doing it through a solid. Uh, when you're doing it through a solid, it's kind of like having a whole bunch of marbles lined up touching each other. You push on the one on the one end and the other end shoots out automatically because they're all touching. In air, that's a lot more difficult to do. Um, because they can slide past each other, they can miss each other, and they're not going to transfer all that energy over. So wood has a really high specific heat because it's mostly made of air. It's mostly a bunch of air pockets. That's how the insulation in your house works too. The insulation in your house, like that pink foamy fuzzy stuff that you might see, um, the reason it works is because of all of the air pockets that get trapped inside of there. So if you want to make your insulation work less, you want to compact the insulation down. Sometimes people will buy really expensive insulation that's supposed to be like a foot and a half thick and then cram it into a wall and smash it all into a wall and think it's going to work as well. It does not. Um, so it's the you want it to be fluffy as possible in order for insulation to work. So anyway, um, just some fun little tidbits. I think that takes us up to the next booby trap. So I want to put a line in your notes to know that this is where this uh, booby trap number two is going to stop. You have 13 questions. And uh, look forward to seeing you then. Have a nice day.